Next on our farm system previews, the Texas Rangers, who look like they have the infield set for the next decade or so, as well as some very big name pitching prospects. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started today. So when you're looking at the Texas Rangers, top prospects kind of fill in some of the holes that they have on the big league roster, although the timing isn't quite perfect on all of these guys. So the number one prospect in the system is an outfielder. And the Rangers at the major league level have kind of struggled to find the right mix of guys in the outfield, cycled through a lot of options in the corners last year. And Evan Carter looks to be a fantastic addition that can definitely help. He's just not going to be up for a while. 2020 second rounder out of high school. He just finished uh, uh, an entire season, almost an entire season at high A Hickory. He did get six games, so like a week in double A Frisco, but for the most part, went through high A Hickory last year. 287, 388, 476, 11 home runs, 39 extra base hits, including 10 triples, always notable there. 59 walks to 75 strikeouts, and 26 of 38 on stolen bases. And that's kind of the story for Evan Carter, right? He has blazing speed, usually around, it's, I've seen it at 60. I personally think it's a little bit higher. A lot of folks who saw him early last year are probably a little bit thrown off. He had a foot injury for part of the year. He fouled a ball off his foot at the plate. And so maybe didn't have the perfect strength or the, the the perfect health with the foot that you would have liked. And I think that that probably caused some people to believe he's maybe not as fast as he is. I actually think he's closer to a 70 than a 60. But offensively, he looks to be a plus hitter and the power is going to come. Again, very young, was 19 last year in Frisco, still ha- or, or 19 in high A Hickory, still had a 476 slug, but something where the physical development, he's 6'4", 190, you obviously have room in that frame for more to come out. He was the, I want to say he was the third youngest player on a full season roster on opening day in high A. Like he's, like he was young for that level as well. So offensively, very, very good with the strike zone. Exceptional strike zone discipline, right? Uh, chase rate of under 20%, like 17%. Uh when he does swing, it's something where he even like he, he usually makes contact in zone swing and miss rate of only 15% and overall swing and miss of only 22%. One of the best marks in this system and one of, I mean, top quartile, if not better in all of minor league baseball makes, does a really good job at making optimal contact. He makes frequent contact, but he also has that combination of Launch angle, exit velocity, he barrels the ball really well. Again, does need to get stronger, does need to add more muscle to his frame. And there is a little bit of disagreement about how much strength he can add. Internal evaluators are a lot higher on that than external evaluators, but either way, uh, it feels like Evan Carter is going to be able to add to the strength to get to at least average, if not above average. Defensively, Very, very good athlete. Again, plus speed, so he has very good range. Every direction does well going back, going up, things like that. He's good with the instincts to go along with that speed when he's on the base paths. So first to third on a base hit, taking extra bases on a single, stuff like that. Uh, Again, stole 28 bags total last year. Probably would have had more if not for the foot injury hampering him a little bit. All in all, Evan Carter appears to be a guy that you're looking at two years, maybe. There's a chance it could be early, like, you know, probably earlier in 2024. I expect him to start off in AA Frisco for Evan Carter to spend most of the year AA Frisco, maybe a little bit in AAA Round Rock. And you could see him as soon as early 2024 with an outside possibility of seeing him in 2023. 
But either way, Evan Carter, fantastic athlete, deserving of the number one prospect spot in this system. Number two prospect, right-hand pitcher Owen White, 2018 second rounder out of high school and has missed a lot of time like since he was developed. He had, uh, you know, he, he didn't throw after the draft. Then he had Tommy John, so missed all of 2019, obviously lost 2020, and then only got 35 innings in 2021 because he broke his hand, like in the first start, very early. Uh, they sent him to the Arizona Fall League in 2021, did very well. I think it was actually named Pitcher of the Year there. And then in 2022, he got most of a season, but he like he still missed a month and a half or so in Double A Frisco because of fatigue in his pitching arm. So like, he's only thrown like 120 innings since he was drafted, but a majority of them were last year. So split between High A and Double A, 14 starts, 15 total appearances. 80 to third innings, ERA of 359, 104 strikeouts, so 11.7 per nine, to 23 walks, 2.6 per nine, eight home runs allowed. What he's doing when he's on the mound is the fastball. It's an above average fastball. It sits in the mid 90s, uh, touches 98 or so. I see it flashes plus sometimes, even though the actual like movement profile of it isn't that great. It's a little straighter than you would like, but he locates it well. He kind of, you know, sequences stuff well and is not afraid to attack a hitter with it. His his out pitch is really the slider. Plus slider sits in the mid 80s, tons of spin to it. He gets chase on it like 40%, 39 or 40% of the time. He has a curveball right behind that. I'd probably call it above average. Sits in the high 70s. It's a vertical breaker. So different little visual pictures there. Again, tons of spin. Almost hits 3,000 RPMs on it. And then has a changeup. It's not average yet. I think it could get to average, but he can throw it for a strike when he needs to. Uh, has a two-seamer. Sits in the low 90s. Doesn't really use it. Obviously, that's something where if you're able to, you could pull that out and do something with it. But Owen White, plus control, he is aggressive, but like in a good way, like competitive. That's probably a better way to put it. The one evaluator I was talking to described him as a bulldog. Like he just, he gets in there, he wants to attack hitters, he wants to beat every hitter, he wants to humiliate every hitter. He wants to blow it past him, he wants to make him look dumb, and when he can harness that, he's a very, very good pitcher. I expect him to probably start at AAA Round Rock, and if everything goes well, especially with the health, because again, he's missed time just about every season since he was drafted, you could see him called up late in the year. Ideally, we've talked about this before, I like getting guys a couple of appearances late in the season so they can see how big league hitters react to their stuff, and then you could look at him being a Rookie of the Year candidate in 2024 and getting that draft pick. Number three prospect in the system, a guy you will see all year and one of the favorites, no favorites, one of the high odd guys for rookie of the year, third baseman Josh Young. 2019 first rounder out of Texas Tech, 6'2", 215. You would have seen him last year if not for the torn labrum that he had lifting weights before the season. So ended up, he came back later in the year. They thought he was going to be out the whole year. Came back later in the year, got about a month in Round Rock and just about a month in Texas. The stats... In Round Rock, 273, 321, 525. The stats in Texas, 204, 235, 418. So, obviously, a little bit of work to do there. Uh, with that slash line, five home runs, 10 extra base hits. This is the big league slash line. Four walks to 39 strikeouts and two of two on stolen bases. He's got... It was a weird year for, jo uh, for Josh Young. It felt like he was pressing a lot. So... Something where, you know, with, because of injuries, the pandemic, he's all, I mean, he's gotten less than a thousand plate appearances since he was drafted, and it felt like he was just pushing to perform and get counting stats as much as possible so he could get back to the bigs. And I don't think he necessarily had to do that. I think give him a little more experience, let him get comfortable. He'll look back to the Josh Young that we know. I've seen a lot of places downgrade his hit tool from a 60 to a 55 based on that small sample at the end of the year last year. But uh, I think the power is plus. A lot of it's pull side. I'll get into that when we talk about the best power hitter in the system and your power tool is only as good as your hit tool. Spoiler alert. 
but he's got really good bat speed. Average exit velo is around 91%. You like that. Very good. But again, very aggressive last year. Swung about half the time, which is high, and missed in the zone about 20% of the time. So again, pressing, I think he'll be fine with a little more experience and getting comfortable at the big league level. He needs to because defensively he is close but below, like, but not quite average. Uh, he's got decent agility. Uh, he does struggle with like a hard shot to the corner. Like, you know, the the, the, the stereotypical uh, hot shot reaction type play at third base, he seems to struggle with those a bit, those line drives that go up the line. But he can make all the routine plays you need him to make. Very really good at setting his platform and make, making an accurate throw. It kind of mitigates the arm only being average or so. And the overall speed's below average. So it's like he has to hit to be comfortable. He's going to challenge for third base. There is a possibility you may have to move him to first. You have a ton of infielders in this system, so there's plenty of guys who can play third if you do that. But for right now, he's going to start off at third base in deference one to Nate Lowe at, at uh, first. And then also because that's where he's been the entire time he's been in the minors. Number four prospect in the system, and w- the favorite of friend of the show, Bryce Patrick of Locked On Rangers, is Luis Angel Acuna, 5'8", 185, 2018 IFA, and yes, he is the younger brother of Ronald Acuna Jr. So, kind of had a breakout last year. Got 91 games between, I'm sorry, had a breakout in 2021. And then last year was a little bit nicked up injury-wise. I think he like strained a hamstring, uh, came back, got time at high A, but then when he got promoted to double A, end of the year, a little bit of struggle. So the total combined slash line, 277, 369, 426, 11 home runs, 29 extra base hits, 51 walks to 96 strikeouts, and 40 of 49 on stolen bases. The whole thing here is he's incredibly aggressive at the plate. I mean, he doesn't swing and miss a ton, mind you, but he swings about half the time. And the issue is his ground ball rate is over 50%. So, like, you have above average power, but this is one of those, your power tool is only as good as your hit tool. And then specifically for Luis Angel Acuna, your power tool isn't as useful if you're not hitting the ball in the air. And so, part of the reason they sent him to AA is because they wanted him to sit there in the Texas League and let those better pitchers expose the holes in his game so that he could work to fix them. Um, I think it's it's a scenario where he, I mean, he also understands that like, yes, I can make quality contact. Uh, the, the, the exit velocities are on the higher end of the scale. He, like he gets the barrel. He, you know, he gets quality, you know, hard hit balls that are at the right launch angles when he gets into one to put it out. It's just the situation of he's got to hit more balls in the air versus on the ground. He hits too many on the ground. Defensively, again, above average to plus speed kind of depends. He, again, had that hamstring injury last year. Defensively, he is average. He's not going to stick it short because of the arm. He's going to have to move into second base, which obviously you have both uh, Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon at the big league level. There's been conversation about do we move him to center field? to take advantage of the speed, to mitigate the impact of the arm, and then to not have him blocked at the big league level by half a billion dollars in contracts. So we'll see what he does this season. I expect him to start back off in AA Frisco again with an idea of moving him to Round Rock later in the year and then seeing him in 2024. In just a minute, I want to get to the state of the pitching. There are some very big names for pitching prospects in this system. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Built Bar. Uh, spring training is here. Pitchers and catchers have reported. Position players are trickling in. And so it is time for road trips. Whether you're tri- road tripping to Arizona for the complex leagues there, or you're road tripping to Florida for spring training there, you have to know that Built Bars are the best way to take care of your hunger on the road. If you're anything like me, when you're road tripping, me and my family, we stop at the gas station and everybody loads up on candy you know, candy bars, sweet stuff, potato chips, popcorn, sodas, all of these unhealthy things, right? Instead, look at getting some built bars. So one, they taste good. 100% real chocolate. The flavors are fantastic. Churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, things like that. Uh, 
they keep you full because of the macros. It's only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar, but 17 grams of protein. And that's what keeps you full and satiated and staves off hunger while you're driving. So go to Built.com, order a whatever, you know, all these different flavors, all the fun stuff. And then if you run out on your trip, you can stop at a Walmart, go to the pharmacy section, grab a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puff Built Bars. Or at Sam's Club, go grab a 13-bar box of brownie batter and churro. And then the rest of the ones you need, all of the other flavors, available at Built.com. So this Texas Rangers system has a lot of big-name pitching prospects. Like guys who are well-known, even to casual baseball fans. Uh, Jack Leiter, 6'1", 205, 2021 first-rounder out of Vanderbilt was promoted directly to double A to start his career and seemed to struggle a little bit as he had to adapt and understand uh, how my arsenal works against a college hitter versus how my arsenal works against a professional hitter. So the fastball, plus to uh, above average to plus, it flashed plus in college, kind of looked above average last year because the shape didn't quite seem to be as pure. Uh, Sits mid-90s, touches 100, something where he needs to use it more up in the zone. Uh, Not necessarily something he did a ton at Vanderbilt, and I feel like with the shape and everything and the rest of what he does, it would be a lot better if he threw it up in the zone versus kind of leaving it down, outside, things like that. To go along with it, he's got a slider plus slider, sits in the mid-80s, That is easily like his best off-speed pitch. That's what he gets swings and misses on. That's what he gets chases on. He's trying to to set that up with everything else. The curveball, upper 70s, it's probably above average, has a big break to it, big vertical break to it. I think it would be better, again, if he was throwing that fastball high. They come out of the same slot. They, they, you know, they, they come out. You can see the curve out of the hand because it starts higher in the zone than the rest of them do because he's not elevating the fastball. If he was throwing the fastball up, the curve would disguise a little better out of the hand and it would kind of give you that vertical breaking thing to it. He doesn't get a ton of uh, swings and misses on it. He doesn't get a ton of chase on it. But again, I think it's fixable and I think he would if he threw the fastball up in the zone more. He has a change up in the mid 80s, really doesn't, use it a ton, really isn't that great. And then he struggled to throw strikes last year compared to when he was at Vandy. And I think part of that's because guys aren't biting on this curveball. Uh, strike strike rate, strike thrown rate was about 59%. Feels like it was in the mid 60s when he was in college. And, you know, because of that, he's trying to get guys to chase the curveball and they're not biting. The walk rate, again, was about 5.4 per nine. So some work to do there. Uh, again, he needs to throw the fastball up some more, throw more strikes in general. And then he needs to figure out something that works against lefties. Maybe it's that changeup. It's improving that changeup a bit. He gave up 11 home runs last year. Eight of them were to lefties, despite facing lefties a lot less often than righties. So something where if he can make these changes, you're looking at a number three, possibly a number two, but he's got to make these basic changes to the pitch mix and the way he uses them so that he can hopefully reach that ceiling. I expect him maybe back to double-A to start the year, and then from there, you're looking at if some of these changes stuck, going to triple-A a a little bit later in the year, available for a spot start if you needed him later in the season, would kind of like maybe be the ideal scenario. Uh, Kumar Rocker, teammate of his at at, uh, Vanderbilt, also in this system. Obviously, kind of a famous saga of what happened. He was drafted by the Mets. They didn't like the, the medicals. He didn't sign. Uh, went to the Frontier League through through a couple times there. Was drafted third overall. Got uh, five million dollars, so about two thirds of the value. And then the money that was saved went to the next pick, Brock Porter, who's coming up in just a second. So first rounder, obviously in 2022, went to the AFL. It was the only ex- he didn't throw with affiliated teams after the draft. Uh, all he did was he went to the AFL. In those six starts, very small sample size, 14 total innings, 4-5 ERA, 18 strikeouts, so 11.6 per nine, to 12 walks, 7.7 per nine, no home runs allowed. 
traditionally in college was very much a fastball slider guy, right? Plus fastball sat in the uh, sat in the mid '90s, had some late action to it, and then plus slider, mid '80s, kind of kind of a wipeout pitch. Uh, you, you saw the fastball look pretty much the same in the Arizona Fall League. The slider was a little more inconsistent. Some of that may be rust. Some of that was he like significantly dropped the low, uh, the arm slot from college, and I don't know if that's something to to alleviate stress on the shoulder. He had a shoulder cleanup last winter after not signing with the Mets. That's why he didn't start throwing it until the spring in the Frontier League last year. But like, not sure if it was that, if it was something else. And so what you're looking at right now is you have a fastball that is good. You have, or I got plus technically. You have a slider that flashes plus, but is kind of inconsistent. And then a below average changeup. It's got some decent fade. Could be useful if he could make it a little bit better. But I don't know if it's because of the arm slot dropping or what it is. The arm speed on the slider and the changeup is noticeably slower than the fastball. Uh, something, especially on the changeup, you want that arm speed to match and you want the release point to match so that you get that tunneling, but you also don't have some sort of tip or tell uh, on the pitches where a hitter could square them up and destroy them. So looking for him to kind of clean that up a little bit. Uh, definitely some work. I would expect, if it was me, I would start Kumar Rocker in high A this year. Uh, yes, he is, you know, he was born in 1999, so he's, what, 24 years old, be 24 this year. Feels like it's a little bit under, but I want him to get his confidence underneath him, and I want him to work on the stamina, things like that. 6'5", 245, not really a physical development kind of scenario. Uh, conditioning, I do have a couple questions about conditioning, simply because he had such a big layoff. But really, I want Kumar Rocker to... Get consistency. If this is his new delivery, he just has a lower arm slot now, that's fine. I just want him to practice it, get more comfortable with it. Again, going to start him at high A, if it's me, with the goal of getting him to uh, double A sooner rather than later. The third notable pitching prospect in the system, mentioned him a second ago, Brock Porter. 6'4", 208 was the 2022 20, fourth rounder out of high school. That was the second pick that the Rangers had. So they took Rocker and Porter back-to-back picks. They have the same agent. So some of that money, I I have a feeling a lot of that was kind of prearranged. But the actual things that he does, the fastball looks like a plus pitch, sits somewhere around the mid-90s, a ton of sink to it. So very effective at getting ground balls. To go along with that, he has a very good changeup. It's kind of neck and neck between him and Dylan Lesko from the Padres of who has the best changeup in the prep class. And again, it's so rare to see good changeups from prepsters because one, the changeup is usually the last pitch you learn. It's the least effective pitch. And it's something where you typically don't need that in high school because you can blow a fastball by a guy. So uh, he throws the changeup. He believes in it. He throws it very well. It has very severe late drop to it. It also has a ton of velocity separation. I've seen some of these changeups 20 miles an hour slower than the fastball fantastic changeup. Uh, it kind of darts down and away from a righty. So good weapon there. Uh, the slider and the curveball are the other two secondaries that he has. Uh, he's got to figure out which one's going to work best. I think the slider's better than the curveball. The curveball doesn't really seem to work with the fastball changeup combination. The Rangers have had discussions. Do we give him a slurve? What do we kind of figure out? So he's got to work on that. And then his his arm action and his delivery, very long, takes a little bit longer to the plate, so there's concerns about stolen bases there, as well as there's enough extra moving parts in there where I feel like it negatively impacts the command and the control. So if he can work on that, a lot of things, but obviously he's going to start uh, in the complex league this year. You may see him uh, moving to low A late in the year, but either way, a nice little starter kit here for Brock Porter. He's going to work on the physical development. He said his goal was to throw 103. So some work to do there, but you like what you have in Brock Porter. In just a minute, I want to get to the superlatives. We've covered some of these things, but there's a couple interesting things, including your breakout prospect. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, so it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel app. 
Safe, secure, super easy to use. You can bet on everything from the money line, point scores, uh, threes that are drained, steals, things like that. And FanDuel lets you combine all of these bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. If you're here for baseball, like I am, uh, you can look at, there's some interesting props out there. As of Thursday morning, despite hearing the news of some uh, side soreness for Jacob deGrom, he is still the favorite for American League Cy Young at plus 500. When you look at Rookie of the Year, Josh Young is tied for 7th in Rookie of the Year odds at plus 1,400. He's tied with Oscar Colas of the White Sox and D.L. Hall of the Orioles. Ahead of him is Royce Lewis, which is weird because he won't be around for like half the season. Tristan Cassis of the Red Sox, who supposedly changed his swing to get a little more power out of it. Uh, Grayson Rodriguez, pitcher for the Orioles. Matsutake Yoshida of the Red Sox, which I don't really feel like the Japanese players who have been professionals should be in Rookie of the Year conversations, but that's a MLBPA thing, not me. And then Hunter Brown of the Astros and Gunnar Henderson of the Orioles. So he's in there. He's got good odds. So don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to make more uh, to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Okay, so superlatives in this system. The guy who your power tool is only as good as your hit tool and who needs to stay healthy, somebody we've already talked about, third baseman Josh Young. So the time that he missed. He had the torn labrum last year. He tore it, again, uh, lifting weights before the season, had surgery, uh, didn't get into, uh, didn't get, his season didn't get started until like late July. Again, got a brief call up at the big league level, got just like 26 games or so. In 2021, he also missed time because he fractured his foot. And so his season in 2021 didn't start until mid-June. Obviously, he lost 2020 because of the pandemic. So like, Give the dude some bubble wrap. He needs to get here healthy. He needs to stay healthy so that he can hopefully get a full season in in the bigs. But I also have him in here as your power tools only as good as your hit tool. When you look at some of the advanced stats of what he did last year, he makes high quality contact, uh, barrel percentage, and granted, small sample size, he, he hit 60 balls, but... 10% barrel percentage. The MLB average is 6.7. His his max exit velo was 108, which is healthy. It's not MLB leading, obviously. It's like 122 from O'Neill Cruz. Uh, Optimal angle sweet spot. He got about 40% of the time. And when you look at the specific pitches that he did well against, slugging a 458 on fastball, slugging a 462 on off-speed. Again, obviously... You have sample side stuff there. Breaking balls. He only saw about 40% breaking balls compared to 50% fastballs and 10% off speed. But he struck out more on breaking balls than anything else. So a little bit of work to do there. Swing and miss on breaking balls, 44% of the time. Swing and miss on off speed, 38% of the time. So feast or famine on off speed pitches. Kind of just famine on breaking pitches. Definitely something to work on. And when you watch what he actually did, where he hit these balls last year, he pulled all five of these home runs. The only the only non-single that went to the right side of the batter's eye was he hit one double and one triple that way. Everything else, all of his extra bases uh, and all of his home runs were pulled to left field. So definitely something where I feel like you're going to see a lot of pitches that are going to be down and away. They're going to be on the outer half of the plate, and he's going to have to make those adjustments, especially I'm imagining righty sliders down and away, probably after the first couple weeks when the book gets out on him, if not earlier, are going to start eating him up, and he's going to have to make those adjustments. Your breakout prospect in this system Outfielder Yason Morabell, 6'2", 170, 2020 IFA, got in 41 games last year at the Arizona Complex League. 329, 405, 487. Three home runs, 17 extra base hits, 17 walks to 34 strikeouts, and 5 of 10 on stolen bases. Defensively, I don't actually love him that much. I think his his speed is average. He can play center field now. He's going to end up in a corner, and I think he'll end up being probably an above-average defender in a corner, provided the physical development doesn't take too much of his speed away. Uh, Now, 
Offensively, this is what I like. I think his contact ability is plus. In the DSL, he actually had more walks than strikeouts, which is fantastic from a very young hitter with the caveat of oftentimes you're facing very young pitchers and some of that maybe they couldn't find the strike zone. But uh, it's this is, a, this is a scenario where he needs to make some adjustments to the swing to get the barrel in the zone quicker and keep it there longer. But other than that, I like the contact ability. Again, I think the power is going to develop into plus power with the physical development. You know, 6'2", 170 is a little bit on the lighter side. I'm heavier than 170 and shorter than 6'2". And so, you know, like thinking about I, you know, I, me versus him. Like he's definitely got to add more muscle and things like that. But again, I really feel like, especially based on what I've seen in the offseason of the workouts, he's going to come in. I expect him to start off in low A down east, and probably to do pretty well with an idea of getting him into high A later in the year. Uh, best outfield defender in this system, it's Evan Carter. Kind of hard to to argue with that. Number one prospect in the system for a reason. He's absolutely fantastic. Uh, stay tuned. It's a fantastic week this week. Tomorrow is our very last farm system preview of the 2023 preseason. We look at the 60 and 102 Oakland A's who have traded just about everything that's not nailed down or making more than the league minimum for almost nothing but arms and speedy outfielders. So we're going to see how that's going, uh, as well as check in they have a prospect in in the World Baseball Classic. In the meantime, if you have questions for Monday's mailbag, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball, show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. You can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com, or drop your questions in the Locked on MLB Prospects Discord. Link is in the episode description on YouTube. Link is in the show notes on audio. Until tomorrow's show, this has been Locked on MLB Prospects. Oh.